Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, February 14, 2019, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. If anyone's still having trouble finding the webinars, let me know. I think we've solved all the issues, and but if not, let me know. So what we talk about? Well, obviously, we want to continue to talk about current market conditions, your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, hold off on the questions that unless they're related to the slides and until we get to the live charts and then hold off on your stock picks, too. And then once we do get to the live charts, just ask about one stock at a time. You can ask about as many as you want. Just ask about a stock, though. And then one other thing for your benefit, too, is to hit return after you ask about a stock. So this week's focus is, and I probably need a better name for it, but success is really in the now, in the right now when it comes to trading. And that's along the lines of this micro versus macro theme I've been hung up on lately. And that'll make more sense in a minute. And then another bear market update. I think things still look a little questionable longer term, but short term, in the immediate term, the market's doing pretty good. And we'll just look at the live charts this week for that. If you want to go back in over the last several weeks or even several months to see some of the timing systems, I'd recommend you do that on YouTube. Also, take the market timing course, which you could find on my website at davelander.com slash members. That was a disclaimer screen that just zoomed by. If you want to read it, you can read it off my website or just take my word for it that all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Now, if you want to succeed in trading and in life, I think you really need to embrace the fact that the micro is more important than the macro. And this is something that if you know me, I tend to get hung up on something and beat the dead horse a little bit when it comes to certain subjects. But I was thinking about it as it's going live. Over probably 30 something years ago, I was reading a lot of Anthony Robbins type of stuff. And one thing that he said, and others said it too, but I'll give him credit, is that in every action, ask yourself, are you moving toward or away from your goal? And we'll circle back to that towards the end of the presentation. But the more I look into it and dig into it from a trading psychology standpoint, the more I'm embracing how important the micro is. And that goes for trading and in life. That's why I put in life in parentheses. We all have these longer term big aspirations and that future someday, that bright, rosy future someday. But I think we have to reel it back in at how do we get there. And we get there through following the process of the micro. And that's placing that stop, placing that entry, provided, of course, you had a well-thought-out plan and you're not just trading off the cuff. Now, after years of soul searching and trading and interacting with thousands of clients, studying psychology journals, and even a little neurology, you're probably thinking, well, I want to party with this guy, along with tons of behavioral finance or behavioral science books or behavioral economics. They all tend to kind of blur together. I'm not sure what the exact distinction is. And reading everything related to trade psychology that I can get my hands on, I have reached a conclusion, and that conclusion is that we're pretty crazy. <laughs> I know. Shocking, huh? Now, in just a few examples here, there's a case where a seasoned airline pilot, and we'll come back to him in a few minutes, he makes an emotionally charged decision and kills 546 people on the ground. And this was not some new pilot. This was a seasoned veteran, someone that they actually used in their safety posters because he was that good. In a lot of cases, they'll talk about where a juror's conviction rate changes drastically with their sugar level. 
if you are, if your juror goes out to deliberate before lunch, you don't have, or you don't have as good a chance of getting off as if, as when the jurors come back after lunch. And I do remember as a kid in grammar school, we had to read a story about jurors. I forget the name of it, but I was just thinking about it as I'm going live here. And it talked about how one juror had tickets to a basketball game and one might have had tickets to a ballet and others had other reasons where they didn't want to be where they are. And more specifically, they had to get out of where they are within a certain time frame to make it to the sporting event or to get back home or whatever the case may be. And the point of the story, if my memory is correct, is how these human urges were encouraging these people to make a hasty decision. And I think the point was that one of the jurors was a little bit more, maybe he didn't have anywhere to go, whatever, but he made everybody relook at all the information, even though it took a little longer to get the right verdict. And the same holds true in, in a lot of other situations where all these behavioral science books, they talk a lot about mistakes that doctors make because they rush to judgment or it could also be because they're sugar low or whatever the case may be. And one example they often give is we do have this propensity to cut off our nose to spite our face. And we do tend to be a little schadenfreude at times. And that's just a, a big word for saying that we occasionally take pleasure in other people's pain and, again, cut off our nose to spite our face. And one example that I've read quite a bit is when you or they have an experiment where you have one person in one room and one person in the other, and you decide on how much money that other person gets. They give you 10 bucks. And you say, okay, well, I'm going to give him X amount of dollars and I'm going to keep the rest. Well, the only caveat is the person in the other room can accept or reject your offer. If they accept your offer, they keep their money and you keep what's left of the 10 bucks that they gave you. Well, overwhelmingly, if you give the other person less than half of the money, that person will tend to reject that offer. And so you both go home with nothing and they feel like they want to punish you for, how do I say this nicely? <laughs> Remember, was it Bill and Ted's, you ditched Napoleon? <laughs> he was a dick. <laughs> anyway, I found this last minute and this comes from thinking fast and slow. The other thing we, we tend to do, we have this really bad loss aversion where we start losing and we don't want to stop. And if you look at like government projects, they just keep dumping money in them, dumping money in them. And sometimes they'll never have a payoff. And I just happened to notice the other day, there was a railroad they're gonna ditch that's between San Francisco and LA because it's gonna cost way more than they ever thought. And a lot of people are thinking, wow, they wasted the taxpayer's money. And that's, why why quit? Is well, we'll quit because it's going to get uglier and uglier. And there's many cases in all these books where people just keep losing more and more and more and more and more, and they won't accept that loss. Your first loss. What's it? What's the old say? Your first loss is your best loss. So a lot of times people will hold on just to through sunk cost fallacy or through loss aversion, whatever the case may be. And I've been in these presentations before where. I've had people say, yeah, I wrote a stock from like 50 bucks to 200 bucks and then back down to zero because once it got to 200, they felt pretty good. And then it drops to like 175 and they're like, well, if it ever gets back to 200, I'm going to get out at 200. They get that that number stuck in their head and then it drops to 150 and they start thinking, well, 175 is not that bad if it ever gets back to 175 and so on and so forth. So we we do a lot of stupid things because we can't really help ourselves. We can't get out of our own way. And lately I've been thinking a lot about this as I crack open yet another one of these behavioral science type of books. The latest one I'm reading is Sway, which I'm gonna talk about in just a few minutes. And I'm beginning to think, is this all really a net negative? And I'm a big fan of putting positive things into my life. And I begin to wonder, 
it sure seems like this failability of human nature and, and, and studying it and obsessing over it to some extent, is that creating a net negative with me? And a few days ago, I found the answer from Dan Arley. I hope I'm saying his name right. Once you understand the way our human nature truly operates, you can decide how to apply that knowledge to your professional and personal life. And that's from the upside of the rationality. And I'd recommend you read this book. I think he's a pretty good writer, and I found it very enjoyable. And in going to his website, I noticed that he had a little TED Talk, and I watched it. And it was another one of those stories. In this case, it involved him. He was burned by a martyr grenade in the Israeli army years ago, and he had to go through a lot of pain and suffering. And I think that that through that pain and suffering, a lot of that comes out in his writing about human nature. And he, he was relating one of the stories to one of the doctors that seemed to be making a, a big dis- mistake that was somewhat emotionally charged. And I won't ruin it for you. Watch the TED Talk. But I guess I'll give you the conclusion. The conclusion is that from a positive perspective, if we understand When we go wrong and understand the deep mechanisms of why we fail and where we fail, we can actually hope to fix things. So that's where I'm going with all this behavioral science and finance or economics. I'm never sure exactly what to call or just this failability of human nature in general. And I think that once you recognize this and once you learn about these things and once you learn that it's normal to feel a certain way, I think you're well on your way to solving some of these problems. And it reminds me of what Charles Kettering once said, a problem well stated is a problem well solved. Now, as I've been talking about quite a bit, in the peeling of the trading psychology onion, the whys, W-H-Y-S, eventually becomes the whys, W-I-S-E. And one of my epiphanies... And this was, I confirmed it was in Larry Williams' son's book. And the name of it is The Mental Edge of Trading. And I'd recommend you read that one, too. And if you check books to read, if it's not up there now, I'll have it up there on the website. But one of the things the book really focuses on is figuring out who you are personally from a psychological standpoint. And he strongly urges you to take a... A personality test, and I did, and I scored very low in agreeableness, and I didn't score at all in modesty. And when I told my wife and kids that I scored low in agreeableness, they looked at me like I pooed my pants, as I often joke. It's kind of like the first time I went to Starbucks, and I asked for a cup of coffee, and that's kind of the look that I got, that look they give you. I later had a teenager, my teenager, teach me how to order what I wanted. And I still didn't fully embrace this personality test because I thought I was agreeable. And I guess I'm agreeable as long as you agree with me. And I really didn't believe this test, even though my wife and children looked at me like I pooed in my pants. I dug further into the test and saw that I scored like 100% an extroversion. Well, I am, <laughs> I am a bit of a ham and I can often seen, be seen at least doing the uh, floss, not the dental one, but the dance at parties. It drives my wife and kids nuts when I do some of these things. I like, like to do things to embarrass my kids. <laughs> anyway, I'm not stupid enough to make the short trip joke about the wife. Now, one of the things that I came across this morning while digging through my big batch of psychology books, at least the ones I haven't packed up yet, was speculation as a fine art and thoughts on, I guess it should be life, by Dixon Watts. And one of the quotes in there was, man begins with simplicity, advances to complexity, and then returns to simplicity. And that sort of illustrates the the holy grail hunt that we go through. Now, the only problem with this holy grail hunt is a lot of times many of us get stuck somewhere in the process and we don't end up coming out the other end. Now, this is by by that, I mean that we we start over here and confusion begins to set in and we at some point we end up holy grail hunting and the problem is a lot of times we come we get kind of stuck in this loop. Now, for me, 
my true enlightenment eventually came when I decided or discovered that there was no Holy Grail and something simple could actually work. Part of that epiphany was I used to wake up two hours early every day. I still wake, I wake up even earlier now. But part of that epiphany was that I did all this mechanical testing and I used to, I've told the story a thousand times. I know I'll try to make it quick. But I would go home and brag to my wife, Marcy, oh, I just came with the system the 73% correct, drawdowns, blah, blah, blah. And I was all proud of my system. And sometimes it'd be systems during the day. And one day she just, she usually suffered a fool gladly. And one day she said, and if you guys who are married know that sometimes your wives, your wives, <laughs> sometimes your wife, I guess, it, I guess in some cases it could be your wives. My wife watches some of that trash TV. I was in there the other day. It was like, the guy's got like five ugly wives. I'd rather have one pretty wife than five ugly wives. Anyway, I digress. But your wife could ask some really tough questions. And I think sometimes for us guys, we need someone to ask these really tough questions. Anyway, long story endless. I know, too late. She said, how many trading systems do you really need? And it's like, well, at first I was a little taken back, but then I realized that you just need one, and that's the one that you're going to follow. So my leaving this holy grail hunt has prompted me to simplify trading and make trading simplified. In fact, I actually trademarked that phrase. And it becomes a wise to wise journey where I sort of vacillate from just do it, then going, then I go on a deep dive in the trading psychology and I just come back to that just do it Nike sort of philosophy. And then in going through that loop, I find myself sometimes off on a little neuroscience. I've got a thousand page book. Someday I plan on reading on neuroscience. Of course, it got packed away in the booth. So I might put that off for about a year until we unpack it. But I have studied quite a bit of neuroscience and I'm often preaching how the market's a bad teacher and all, these, all this failability of human nature. And I keep coming back to just do it. Now, the good thing is I find that this new journey that I've been on, I say new, it's been for the last 20 years, but this newer journey that I've been on is a much more positive one than going on a holy grail hunt. And, and through this state of enlightenment, I find that I still continue to look for ways to beat the market or certainly just stay on the right side of the trend. And a lot of that has become much more simplified. And I don't know if it's all the studying of psychology or whatever that helps, but the bottom line is the only way to make money is to capture a trend. Now, the point is the short term affects the longer term. And if you don't believe me, always answer your wife honestly when she asks you about her, her new outfit or haircut. <laughs> and you'll soon find out. It was funny. I was putting together this presentation last week and it was my anniversary. It was 21 years and I got to thinking, 21 years, you get less time for armed robbery. And of course, I wasn't stupid enough to make that joke, but that would be a good example of a short-term joke that probably would have, or short-term thing would have a longer-term impact. So shorter term emotions and stress and temptations can be deadly. And this was the example I was referred to earlier. There was a plane that was supposed to land and refuel in Las Palmas, and I hope I'm saying that right, and they were diverted over to Tenerite. And the reason why they were diverted was because a terrorist had placed a, did I say terrorist? <laughs> really? Bubble what was? Uh, a terrorist had placed a bomb or blew up a bomb, whatever, in the, in the gift shop, in the flower shop. So the plane was diverted and a lot of other planes were diverted. And I'm guessing that airport they were going to land at was much bigger than the airport in Tenerite. So what happened was you ended up with all these planes and the tower was overwhelmed. And on top of all that, the fog began to roll in. Well, this, this very seasoned pilot who was a symbol of or who embodied the safety and just what everything a great pilot embodies, decided that he had to take off because they have some kind of limit on how many hours a pilot can fly 
and he wanted to be on schedule, and he wanted to keep his impeccable record impeccable. But the fog had rolled in, and he didn't have permission from the tower. And somewhere in all this confusion from this little overrun airport, there was a jet parked sideways across the runway. So this pilot was emotionally charged, and he decided to just take off without clearance. And he soon found out there was a jet on the runway. He did clear the top of the jet, but then the tail dragged and ended up killing 546 people. So the short term does have a big impact in the longer term, obviously. Now, bringing it back to trading, do you ever feel unnatural in trading? you ever feel trading unnatural and difficult? And that's if you do, that's good. You're normal. And as I've been preaching quite a bit lately, my latest dead horse is that good traders are humble and are often humble. And these get-rich gurus lately have really been aggravating me. And I don't know why I'm letting them get to me, but I catch myself doing a little research on them or clicking on some of their ads and stuff just to see what's going on. And it's obviously pump and dump and BS and things like that. But anyway, as I've been saying lately, I have friends who run hundreds of millions of dollars and I it used to be billions in one case, but that's Greg Moore. He says retired. He was running, I think, $5 billion when he retired. But I do have some friends running hundreds of millions of dollars, and they might be approaching the billion-dollar market, at least one in particular. Anyway, they never brag about how great they are in the markets. And I'm fortunate enough, mostly through the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts, to be friendly and friends with a lot of these guys. And it was interesting down in St. Lucia, one of the traders down there, I was at Charlie Kirk's retreat and he was talking about the trader that is, was talking about, he ever noticed that around the bar, you're a trader who is a novice or doesn't know what he's doing, brags about how much money he makes. And the one that's been around for a while and others that have been around for a while, they tend to talk about how the market's a pain in the butt or what they lost and things like that. So Good traders are often humble and humbled by the market. And they don't post P&Ls and brag about what they made. It's not even noon. And again, they don't post pictures of themselves in front of Lambos. Like I said last week or week before, whenever I showed this, this is a real Lambo. This is not a Matchbox car. Look at Big Dave and look at this <laughs> car. So people are like, why do you call you Big Dave? It's like, well, this is to scale. Anyway. And the Steve Pressville quote comes to mind. If you go see, if you go to look at books to read on my website, you'll see his book. And it's a very short read, quick read. I really enjoyed this one. And it's called The War of Art. And I think it's directed towards the artist, but I think it applies to, to all of us. And he said, the counterfeit innovator is wildly self-confident. The real one is scared to death. And I kind of go from wildly self-confident to scared to death all in the same hour or same 10 minutes. Now, the bottom line is we're not good at being wrong. And this is especially true for those who score low in agreeableness and modesty, too, because I want to show off and I want to be right. OK, the bottom line is you're going to be wrong a lot. Now, if we take a step back, the only way to make money trading is to what? Capture a trend. You have to sell higher than you buy. Now, I'm not saying buy low and sell high because... That cannot be done. That has a hint of reversions that are mean or trend fighting. What I am saying is sell higher than you buy. If you're a trend follower, you will be buying at higher levels than you could have because you're waiting for that trend to begin to develop. And that's okay. Now, the only way to make money trading is capture a trend, but the only way to make real money is to capture a longer term trend. There's a lot of short term things you could do out there, and they'll work pretty good here and there. The problem is you occasionally have to capture a big winner. Otherwise, when you have the inevitable big loser that comes along, you won't have enough profits to pay for it. So the real money is in the longer term trend following. Now, unfortunately, there's about a 22% chance of doing that. In other words, there's only about a 22% chance of capturing a long term trend. Now, I found this out through years and years and years of mechanical testing, but these numbers seem to hold true. If you poke around the internet enough, you can find very similar numbers. So if you look at that from the negative side, said alternatively, you're going to be wrong about 78% of the time in longer term trend following. Now, without going off too far on a tangent, 
Imagine that, and you go off on a tangent. <laughs> Somebody once said, <laughs> Dave, I like your tangents and rambling. That's I learned something from that. I don't learn much from all that stuff you're saying, but when you go off on a tangent, I, I get something out of that. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, thanks, I think. <laughs> but what I've tried to do is solve for that 78% or at least reduce that number a little bit and increase the chance of being right by taking a hybrid approach by trading for both short-term and longer-term gains through the money management. See the latest Q&A, which would be posted, uh, which should be posted tomorrow on the 15th of February on a little bit on money management there on the 2%, why we pick 2%, and then also go through the money management module for a lot more in the hybrid approach to money management. Now, why do we stray from doing the right thing over the micro? Well, we don't like being wrong, especially guys like me who score 0% or low 20s, I think it was, in agreeableness. The market operates on a different time frame than we do. We, knew, we need something, and the market doesn't care about our needs. I'm going through that right now. I'm selling a house. And we were in negotiation just recently. It's like, so we come off the price, another 10K. And it's like, okay, well, you you need some repairs. What if we just give you 10K? It's like, before you know it, it's just like money's just, you know, coming from all directions. And then my wife was saying, yeah, you're going to have some this cost and that cost because she's a she's a notary and she was a realtor for a while, many years ago, and she knows the business. Anyway, and then on top of that, we're building a house. It's like, oh, okay, well, you need another 4K for your beams. You know, I thought beams would be like 100 bucks each. How much could a how much could a freaking piece of wood cost, <laughs> you know? And then it's like, oh, by the way, we need to rent a place. And okay, well, what's a place going to cost a rent? Oh, well, we need to rent a place for like six months, eight months, 10 months, whatever. It's like, that would be 20K. <laughs> you know, it's like you just, this money just, it's crazy, and I'm feeling I am feeling pressure to create something. Like I come in and I'm like, okay, what can I do with those triple leveraged shares? Oh, there's a little weed stock breaking out. Well, I'm not a breakout trader, but maybe I could jump on that little weed stock and pull a few thousand out the market to make up for those beams or for the repairs or whatever. But the market really doesn't care about our time frame. Jesse Livermore has a lot of good quotes here, and. None come exactly to mind, but sort of paraphrasing, he basically says that many a chap have gone broke trying to pay for a bracelet or whatever. And the market really doesn't care about your needs. And I think another reason why we're tempted to stray is that these gurus taunt us. And maybe that's why I'm aggravated with these gurus is because they're they're kind of ruining it for everyone. They're ruining it for the people who actually are doing things in a conceptually con conceptually correct manner. I was looking at an email this morning. I couldn't help myself. And the guy made some money. And I'm like, well, let's check out that stock. And I looked it up and it was 32 cents. And obviously, I mean, there was no pattern there that I could see where he could have made money on this trade. And obviously, it was like a pump and dump type of situation. That's the only way I could figure it out. But the gurus are out there taunting us. Now, in the strain from the micro while losing sight of the macro, I discovered there's actually a name for that, as I've recently written about, and that's called the crazia. And it's kind of interesting. It's It sounds like it's got the word crazy in the middle of it, huh? You're trading making you a crazier? And a crazier is a state of mind in which someone acts against their better judgment through the weakness of will. Have you ever violated your plan? Have you ever taken an impulsive trade? Yeah, of course you have. Now, James Clear in Atomic Habits defines a crazia as a state of acting against your better judgment is when you do one thing, even though you know you should do something else. That's been a reoccurring theme for years at DaveLandry.com, and it's only up until fairly recently where I realized there's actually a word for that. And acrasia is what prevents you from following through on what you set out to do. Well, again, it's what you do in the in the micro, which is screwing up your macro, which is screwing up your longer term plans. Now, one thing they often talk about, which relates to acrasia and other types of short term behavior that you shouldn't be doing, is we have this time 
and consistency. That longer term goal is somewhere out there. It's somewhere, somewhere, someday. And it's hard to stay focused on that because there's this little immediate gratification in from in front of us. And as I often say, it's because we live in this microwave society and we're used to immediate gratification and we're used to everything being instant. It it drives my wife crazy. Short trip. I did it anyway, didn't I? Can't help myself. See, I got to focus on that micro versus the macro. But it drives my wife crazy when I don't answer my text. And I'm kind of the same way with my friends. I'm not very good with a cell phone. Now, the thing about the short term is there's definitely a tangible and rewarding aspect to it. It's like a lot of the acrasia talk focuses on procrastination. When you should do a certain thing now, you should be working on some kind of deadline, but you have to start working on that now, and instead you procrastinate. Well, I read somewhere, what's the, this, what's the joke about procrastination? It, it pays off right away. And a lot of times that short-term doing the wrong thing can be very tangible and rewarding. I like drinking beer. I know if I drink beer, I'm going to get fat. But when I'm drinking that beer, that beer tastes good. But a lot of these things come with a longer term cost. And especially bringing it back to trading, if you're doing the wrong thing shorter term, you're going to end up developing a longer term habit. And getting along the lines of the time inconsistency, and I've seen this several times. I don't know who to attribute this to. It's probably who wrote Thinking Fast and Slow? Kannerman. And uh, what's the uh, Tversky, I think, was also a contributor to this. But... I've seen this in many different places, so I'm not sure who attributed it to. But the example they use is if you were offered $500 today or $505 tomorrow, which one would you take? Well, overwhelmingly, we would take $500 today. But when they make that argument about, well, okay, what if I give you $500 today and $505 365 days from now, or 366 days from now, I should say, most people would say, well, just give me $505. I waited that long. Might as well wait that extra day. But when you do the math, it's still just one extra day. And then again, modern society pressures this microwave society, this microwave popcorn society that we live in causes us to expect everything and now. And then again, these easy money gurus aren't helping I made all this money in January, and now I'm going to make the same thing in February. Look, I'm off to a good start. Now, whenever I present problems, I want to always make sure that I give you a solution for those problems. And as I often say, you know what you're doing wrong? You know what you're doing wrong. And whenever I work with someone, if I can't figure out what they're doing wrong, and it used to stress me out thinking, that, oh, how in the hell am I going to figure out what they're doing wrong? And then I ask and they tell me. And I've also learned to, to craft some questions from problems that I've seen over the years and, and problems that I, I personally have myself over the years in trading. And usually that helps to flesh out a lot of those problems. In worst case, as I often say, if I look at the actual trades and point out what they're doing wrong, they come back with, I know, I know. Now, the wisdom of Livermore going back 100 years or more, or 100 years maybe, maybe a little less. A stock speculator sometimes makes mistakes and knows that he is making them. Well, I think we often make mistakes and we know that we're making them. Now, my favorite from all this, which became fodder for columns and psychology speeches and articles, was... Dave, you know that passage of Paul, I know not to do, but I keep doing it. And that's from Romans 7, 19, after doing a little poking around. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. And it's interesting. I've been talking about this article that I wrote for Traders Magazine and, again, doing webinars and such on this topic. And then I stumble across this stuff on Acrasia and James Clear's writing. And in all these writings on Acrasia, they talk about Paul had suffered from acrasia. And again, the simple solution to all this is just don't do that. It's like the doctor, doctor joke. Now, if the don't do that Nike philosophy doesn't help, then we have to become 
committed. Now, that sounds like you're going to a, a scene asylum. <laughs> well, we have to have commitment. How's that? And I was poking around trying to find an answer, trying to find an answer. And I have the eight volume set of the Encyclopedia of Psychology on my bookshelf. And I know you're probably thinking, geez, Dave, I want to party with you once again. And I looked at the definition in there and I thought it was pretty good. Whatever it is that makes a person engage or continue a course of action when difficulties are positive alternatives it influenced the person to abandon the action. Now, those positive alternatives in trading can often be perceived positive alternatives. And by the way, the market will often tempt you to do the wrong thing. There's always a reason to exit a trade and rarely a reason to stay. Now, the commitment devices is something that James Clear has written extensively about, easy for me to say. And if you think about it, like on a, a, a fictitious scale, it would be Ulysses being tied to the mast and putting wax in his crew's ears so he could hear the siren song but not wreck into the siren shore. And allegedly, the hunchback of no, Notre Dame, I forget who wrote that, escapes me at the second, but the author was facing a seemingly impossible deadline because he went out and partied for months and months and months until he got to a point where he had to hurry up and finish this novel or he would be out of a lot of money. He put on a sack and he had his assistant lock away his clothes and he couldn't leave the house in a sack until he finished his book. And then allegedly the author of Moby Dick was chained to his desk to finish. I don't know if that actually happened, but anyway, those stories are out there for sure in both fiction and Nonfiction. Now, a commitment device is something that will help you to do the right thing in the future by making bad habits difficult in the present. And James Clear talks a lot about the fact that it's not so much about making good habits easy, but more so by making bad habits hard. So you're going to have to figure out what your own commitment devices will be, but I'd be willing to bet that you already know. For instance, if you're feeling the siren call of day trading, as I think we all do, if our screen is up during the day and we're looking at it. So if you feel that siren call to day trade or micromanage or anything else outside of your plan or core methodology, you could just turn off your screens. Now, I'm I, as I wrote in my one of the columns recently, I have my screensaver set to about five minutes, and I keep thinking I'm going to change that on my main trading station. And admission time, I, I am a little guilty. And if you notice in these presentations, if my mic gets a little bit lower and it comes back higher, it's because I walked over to my trading station and shook my mouse so I can continue to watch the screen. So I'm guilty as charged. But I do often keep myself very busy to where that screen will go blank and I'll keep working. And that has helped me tremendously in and of itself. So it could be something as simple as setting a screen timer. Now, as I've said ad nauseum, a lot of times I'll get so pissed off, drop a couple F-bombs, and I'll go for a walk. And where I live now, I'll go around a block. The block's roughly about two miles. And then if my wife is home or doesn't have work, We'll take a little bit longer route. We'll go about four or five miles on a walk. And I come back about an hour later, hot and sweaty usually. And not every time, because if it were every time, I'd be pretty darn fit and not such a big Dave. But not every time. But many times I'll come back and the market has completely turned around. And those F-bombs I dropped were absolutely unnecessary. Now, the other thing you could do is Take your wife or significant other to lunch, just not at the same time, obviously, as I often joke. And the example I give here is several weeks back, I was trying to pay for some beams, I think. I forget it was the beams or the fact that we moved the, we had to move the garage back 15 feet. Oh, that's only that's only about 25,000. <laughs> anyway, uh, I know I know I was feeling those pressures that I was sitting there looking at those triple levered shares and Maybe, maybe I could do a five-minute bow tie or something and just pick up a couple thousand here, a couple thousand there, pay for those stupid beams or whatever the case may be. And my wife stuck her head in my office and said, lunch? And I'm like, yes, please. So I went off to lunch. 
Now, commitment devices, as I just kind of showed you, can be really simple and try to commit to something really simple. But if drastic times call for drastic measures, then you need to do that. And the example that I've given recently was a client of mine was doing a lot of day trading. And he's been guilty of this on and off for as long as I've known him. He is a good stock picker and he is really good at executing. And a lot of times he'll take, it's like, a, it's kind of like I remember, it's like being a kid, you know, and having somebody steal your bike and then ride around the block and pop a wheelie in front of your house when they pass. Sometimes he's taking some of the stocks in the Landry list, the list that I put out every day in my trading service, and he's really taking the ball and ran with it or run with it. And uh, run, ran, head run, did run, whatever. He's taking the ball and ran with it and a lot of times make a lot of money, but he does have this propensity to get sucked into the markets and day trade. Well, he has a wealth management account where they allow him to have unlimited trades, which I know that could get you in a lot of trouble. But in order to make those trades, you have to call him in to a secretary. And he told me that he moved the majority of his funds over to this wealth management firm, his trading funds, that is, so he wouldn't look like an idiot. And I think his 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 actual term was he didn't want to look like a lunatic because if he tried to day trade that account, he'd have to call in these trades all day long. And so that one thing there, and it's not that drastic, but it's somewhat drastic. I guess he filled out some paperwork or he just wrote a check, I guess, in his case, is kept him from doing the unnecessary day trading. So the point I'm making in all this, and I'm probably going to beat this horse for a long time and maybe not get up, give up on it, the dead horse that is. Heard recently something like, you can't say that anymore. It's like, well, you know what? <laughs> I'm gonna keep saying it. I don't care. The horse is dead. What is, what what difference? What what the horse is dead? What difference does it make? Now they say it's like you gotta call it smash the potato. Well, what if they found out potatoes have feelings, you know? Whatever. But the micro is more important than the macro. Stop if you heard that before. Well, the way you get around that is, as I alluded to earlier, is be goal-oriented and in every action. You have to ask yourself, are you moving towards that goal or are you moving away from that goal? Now, moving away from that goal would probably best be defined as fear and greed. And moving toward that goal would be just following the process. Again, just do it. Follow your plan, right? Now, following the fear and greed would be micromanagement. You're you're fearing your profits will erode. So you go ahead and lock it all in, even though you should just lock in half if you're following the hybrid money management approach. Or you decide, well, let's let it all ride, Ed, because I want to make more money. Or let's try to make $4,000 for beans, $25,000 move the garage back, another $10,000 in repair, come off the price $10,000. All right, Dave, give it up. But following the process, a lot of times is not doing anything. And that's the hard part to wrap your head around, especially if you're a successful individual. Sometimes the best action is no action, and that's following the process. Now, in following the process, you want to pick the best and leave the rest. As I often say, quoting market wizards, you got to be careful of your intuition versus intuition, okay? And right now, and I'll stop saying this, but right now I'm under pressure to make money. I'm under a lot of pressure to make a lot of money. I mean, I don't have to, but it sure would be nice if I did. And that's, you know, my ego is coming into play that too. Oh, well, I just, I just pay for those beams. Look at me. Now, if you're moving away from your goal, you might find yourself trading for activity or excitement. As I often preach, if you want excitement, go to Las Vegas. Or if you only want to lose half your money, just have an affair. <laughs> I guess I make too many jokes about that. Following the process means you're going to do things that are in your plan, like honoring your stop. Not following the process and moving away from your goal is hold and hope. Well, let me just hold on one more day to see if it comes back. And I'm not talking about a little bit of discretion here and there on opening gap reverse or a stop, Nick. I'm talking about flat out holding as that stock moves further and further away from your protective stop or goes deeper and deeper as you go deeper and deeper into debt on it. Now, obviously, if you're following greed and fear, moving away from your goal, you're gonna abandon your plan. If you're following the process, again, just do it. Follow the plan. Now, I promised to stop this last week at Bandcamp thing, but last 
last year, I guess now, it was in December in St. Lucia. One of the traders there, I think his name was Casey, when we began talking about the trading and more importantly, or the importance, I should say, of a trader's journal, he brought up the fact that he has a confession journal. And I have a notebook here where I wrote shame on the front of it. <laughs> and if I find myself doing the wrong thing, I put, put it in my shame journal. Now, one thing that did come up down there was, and Charlie Kirk was saying this, he said, if you do feel tempted to do those trades that are outside your methodology, then do this, put aside a small account and just do that. And I've talked about doing that before too. And some of you have brought up the really good point that, well, Dave, you can't get a, a little bit pregnant. And I hear you. But if you're going to do it anyway, do it in a small way, get it out of your system and do it in a small account. But what Charlie Kirk came up with, which I, th which I thought was even which greater, which was great, I should say, is that at the end of the year, review your core methodology, see how you did, and then take a look at that account where you did these trades outside of your methodology and see how you actually did with that. And I'd be willing to bet that that's going to really make you think whether or not it all was worthwhile. And keep in mind that when you're doing these off-the-cuff trades, it does take an emotional impact on you. And as I often preach ad nauseum, there is an emotion involved with every decision that you make. So again, you need to ask yourself, are you moving toward that longer-term goal or away from that longer-term goal? As I recently said, make the goal bigger than you. When I put, boy, today's just a day of beating a dead horse. I apologize, but this... I'm going to keep beating a dead horse until you people get it, is what I often say. But when I put together the learning management system and I said, okay, well, let's put the, let's put the goals in here. And, you know, my goals are very process oriented to only take the best trades and, and follow my plan. And every plan, every trade has to be planned out. Unless, of course, I'm doing something like a money lying in the corner opening gap reversal trade. Now, it has to be a really good opening gap reversal trade for me to take it. And a lot of times, you know, the intuition versus intuition comes into play, especially in more recent times, because I'm trying to pull all this money on a trading account, but I gotta be really careful. It's like, is that really the mother of all setups that I'm seeing that, especially if it's outside of my methodology. And anyway, getting back to my goals, which if you're under the member system, you're asked to set your trading goals. So every time you log in, you're forced to reread your trading goals. And that's actually helped me out a lot personally too. But I thought everybody would put it in a process goals, pick the best, leave the rest, and all these things that I preach and others who are realistic about trading preach. And to my surprise, a lot of people put in these goals that were more personally oriented and not necessarily directly related to monetary oriented, more like bigger goals. And some of the people that I met in St. Lucia were looking to leave a legacy for their children and... So we've got to talking about short term versus longer term and doing the right thing. And it's like, OK, well, every time you find yourself tempted to do the wrong thing, just remember that you're taking away from that legacy. And then in my members area, one of the members wants to grow his capital longer term so he could visit his children he lives outside of the States. He wants to visit his children's States more. So he has to be thinking when he goes to do the wrong thing that he's moving in the wrong direction from his longer term goal. So again, kind of beat the dead horse once again. Kind of beat the dead horse and beat the dead horse, huh? The micro can have lasting effects. Okay. Any questions, thoughts, or comments on any of that? Margin call. Hope it's not a margin call. Don't answer it. <laughs> somebody from Trading Markets gave me that years ago, and a lot of you know somebody's going to leave their cell phone on in a in a seminar when it rings up. Come on, say that. All right, let me get my charts up and running. Any questions on anything so far? Comments? I'm using anecdotes. All right, Tracy says, thanks for the important insights. Oh, you're welcome, Tracy. Must be Tracy's first time here. Tracy, he says the, he says the same thing every week. <laughs> it's still good. Thank you, Tracy. Well, I appreciate that. So kind. And by the way, now that we're in the live charts, if you just want to start asking about anything in general, or if you want to ask about some individual stocks, feel free to do so now. It's been a few times, a few minutes, a few times, 
few minutes talking about the market, and then we'll uh, open it up for individual stock picks. But you can go ahead and start typing in those stock picks now. And as soon as I get through talking about the market, we'll get to them. This week, while talking about the markets, since we spent a lot of time over the last several weeks talking about market timing systems and just ways to time the market, I'm not going to spend as much time on uh, on the actual systems themselves. But I do want to just kind of give you a, some little highlights on those. Yeah, keep keep the stock pickets, picks coming, okay? That'll keep the show flowing. Okay. Let's start with the uh, with the micro and work our way out to the macro and all of these indices and such. Okay. All right, let's take a look at First of all, let's take a look at the S&P 500. Now, what's kind of interesting is this is just a 50-day simple moving average, and I want to look at the weekly moving average. Um, I usually don't plot a 50-day simple because it's one of those things where it only matters when it matters. It is well watched, and I often don't plot it unless the market begins to do something like it did recently, like a big sell-off and then a retrace. But anyway, you can see that we are well above it, and just by paying attention to, to Landry Light, meaning that the lows – or greater than the moving average for uptrends like we had back here, or the highs are less than the moving average for downtrends like we had here, can keep you on the right side of the market. And this is especially true when you back out to the weekly. And I've talked a lot about that recently. And we've called it, it used to be called Daylight, and then it was called Dave Light, and now it's called Landry Light. So I think Mike... Gave me that term. Mike, are you here today? Anyway, so we've had this big run in here. People like saying, and I'm saying, Dave, I've been saying, hey, it's overbought. And people are like, hey, Dave, why don't you know it's overbought? Is it because you've been doing this for years? Like, no, uh, it's going up 17% in a couple of months. And I did a presentation a few weeks back on the Q&A about overbought and oversold markets. And it was only up, I think, 10% then. And we looked at the last 10 or 15 years in the S&P 500. And in an entire year, the S&P often doesn't move 10%, okay? And sometimes, obviously, there's negative years. So 17% in a couple of months is a pretty big deal. So the short to intermediate term trend remains up. And this market keeps forging ahead. Today, we have a little bit of, a, of an ochre happening, a little open to get reversal. Take a look at spiders. You can see a little uh, drop lower and so far reversing nicely. I think we could have a, I don't know, but it looks like we could have a decent trend day here, if we take, especially if we take out yesterday's close. But again, the market does remain overbought. And so far, I was very concerned about this overhead supply, but so far it continues to push through this overhead supply. Now, one thing that's kind of cool is getting to the weekly chart and go back and look at the weekend charts for the past several months. I've been talking a lot about the Landry light longer term, especially as it relates to 50 week moving average. And you could see that just staying long when the lows are, are above the moving average. In other words, you have upside Landry light and staying short when the highs are less than the moving average can help to keep you on the right side of the market. Now, obviously you need some money management and, I like to take things on a setup by setup basis, and you'll have the money management built into that to every trade. But as a general statement, paying attention to that Landry light can keep in the right side of the market. We got an alert. Look at that. Goss. Let's take a look at that. Why do I have this as my alerts? Oh, it's a it is a biotech IPO. So to those who know the buy at B, if it closes above 19, that's going to be a buy. I might buy some. We'll see. All right, getting back to the weekly S&P, we put that moving average back in. And we did close above the moving average. Now, in order to get a buy signal longer term with the TFM 10% system, and if you want that system, just go to davelandry.com slash members and sign up if you don't see the banner ad in front of my page. 
But if we have two lows greater than this 50 day, 50 week moving average, then that would be a buy on that. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ, same sort of action going on in the NASDAQ. Let's get back to the daily real quick. You can see nice little run above this 50 day moving average, pushing into this overhead supply, nearly clearing most of it. A little bit of an ogre this morning. Okay. Dave, did you play it? Well, I'm trying to pay for those beams, so maybe I did. <laughs> I'll never tell. Anyway, let's take a look at weekly. Look at that. Above the 50-week moving average. So things, I have to admit, things are getting better, right? Now, what has me concerned, let's go back to the P's just for one second, is so far it looks like we have thrust and then pullback, and then logically the next leg would be thrust down. So when in doubt, let me just remove that last little deal. When in doubt, take the chart out and leave your lines in. And so we have thrust and then pull back. And logically, the next leg would be lower. From a psychological standpoint, and everything I do, by the way, is from a psychological standpoint, I think everybody in that brother thinks they dodged a bullet by buying and holding through this December debacle. And they're feeling pretty good right now. And you know what? I hope, and I know, hope in one hand, and you know the rest. I hope this market continues to go higher, and I hope it goes, I hope it doesn't have a massive correction. But I'm a little concerned that if we do begin to sell off, we could begin to sell off in earnest. And I hate to use the word hope again, but what I've been really hoping for is that we have the mother of all opening gaps higher, and then this thing begins to implode. That would be a great little day trade because i got to pay for those beams, right? Anyway, but looking pretty good, both short and intermediate term. But, yes, we are still overbought. Still looks like the next leg, especially on a weekly chart, remains lower. But so far, so good. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ again. Oh, let's take a look at the Russell. Russell 2000, or as we often call it, the Rusty. Not bad at all there. A little bit of an opening gap reversal. So far, an outside day up. I don't know why this market is going higher, and it doesn't matter, but it is, okay? It just keeps chugging along, and so far, so good. Of course, you don't just want to blindly buy, but it sure seems like things are improving. I'm not seeing a lot of short setting up at the present time. I'm not seeing a tremendous amount of longs either, and that's because the methodology requires a pullback. So as far as new positions, we've been mostly sitting on – our hands personally i think i'm long one weed stock which was an ipo maybe i'll be long that goss by the end of the day i'm um, long huya i'm still long ugp which was established a while back and uh there's something else i'm still long anyway a qtt i think was the other one Anyway, I didn't mean to announce every trade. I'm just saying that I have been getting some longs along the way, and I have been getting long along the way. But I'm also, I don't want to use the word anxious, but I'm very enthused to sell half of these positions as they hit the profit target for when, not if, this market begins to correct or if, God forbid, the individual issues begin to implode. So that's what's going on with the indices. A lot of the sectors look like the market itself. I've been keeping an eye on China in here for what it's worth. And we were looking at that about a week or so ago, but it really didn't give us an entry because it took off from the lows, started pulling back, really didn't pull back that deeply, then it shot higher as of late. As you go through these sectors, these are the major Morningstar industry groups. And by major, I mean the, the, the big group the industry, and then you have the sub-industry group. So the industry might be like metals and mining. Below it would be like gold, silver, and some other areas, copper, aluminum. But these major MIGs, a couple of them are banging out new highs. My only problem with something like, let's say, take real estate, for instance, that's banging out new highs, as I've been saying quite a bit, it's very hard to mount a new leg on top of an old leg. So this market has had a great run higher. I just think it's to be hard for it to sustain. In fact, if you kind of look at it, you can see it's kind of gradually rolling over. As I preach, I like to see a trend do this, and then I like to see it do that. Tarzan speak, this good, okay? Tarzan speak, 
this bad. Well, right now that's kind of bad, right? Not saying that it can't stop, that it can't stop, that it won't stop going higher. It can go higher, but it's sort of dangerous to buy into a market like that. That's just kind of going straight up and expected it to continue to do that. And anyway, as we go through these other areas, you can see most of them kind of look like the market itself. Nice rallies into overhead supply. So there's not a tremendous amount to report in the sectors other than most at this particular point in time look kind of like the market itself. And that's not always the case, by the way. You might be thinking, well, isn't that always the case? No, not necessarily. Sometimes you'll have some that trade independently of the indices, both up when it's down or down when it's up. But right now, and that's why I haven't been doing a lot of sector analysis or at least reporting. I still do sector analysis, but I don't report on it as much lately in the trading services because most of them sort of look like the market itself. All right. John wants to talk about EOLS. EOLS. Let's back the chart out a little bit. Well, first of all, the HV is a little crazy in this one. It's over 100. Not that I won't trade. What's QTT? I think QTT is over 100. Here's one I'm long. Yeah, so it's 107. So not that I won't trade something with a crazy HV, but I like to see a little structure. Notice we had this nice persistent trend here followed by a pullback. It took off nicely followed by a pullback. So, so far it's acting very nicely. This EOLS, a little bit more all over the place. And if we zoom in a little bit on here, you had this big run higher, which was mostly just these, this gap in this day here. And then it hasn't gone that far from there. Maybe on a pullback, I prefer to see a little bit more acceleration over time, followed by a pullback as opposed to just a few bars up. But time will tell. Maybe on a pullback, but eh, it's just been acting a little too erratic, even for Big Dave. <laughs> Mike says, since you're playing all the greatest hits today, I was wondering if you were here. I was like, yeah. Mike actually, uh, did you, did you keep, no, you didn't give me, you gave me a different shirt, but uh, Mike had a shirt that said, keep calm and keep beating the dead horse, uh, which was very nice in solidarity with me. So I need to, uh, I need to get that shirt. I wear your shirt all the time, Mike, by the way. He gave me a shirt that says, uh, if I knew, you'd never see my fat ass again. Well, Home Depot was the one where somebody, and I know who that somebody is, it was doing this, okay, and asked about Home Depot. Home Depot's definitely improving. These big fat stocks, I'm more of a fan of shorting them than buying them. I'd much be, I'd much rather be long a small cap or a Chinese stock or a weed stock or something like that or a biotech than be long a big cap stock not that i won't trade big cap stocks because sometimes like a big oil company will go down bottom out make what i call a phoenix strategy and i'll i'll be i'll gladly jump aboard something like that but as a general statement big cap stocks especially when they're rolling over and the market's rolling over provide a better chance for shorting opportunity now speaking of which take a look at like a weekly bow tie on this one and lo and behold, you have a weekly bow tie down. So if you were looking for a longer term short, I think this would be a possible play here, but only on a trigger. Short to intermediate term, it's going higher, but I wouldn't rush out and buy it. But yeah, it definitely looks a lot better than when uh, it was first brought up. Mike says, you have been on fire today. <laughs> One of the best Q&As in recent memory. Thank, take care. Oh, well, thank you, man. All right. Yeah, I'm trying to make that Q&A. I'm trying to make that sort of the uh, the cherry with the with the learning management system, because obviously a lot of things that I say in the learning management system repeat to that horse. Things you need to hear. You might not want to hear them, but you need to hear them. But the, the Q&A, I think, has really been where I'm very excited about how the Q&A is turning out. And I've really been able to, from an egotistical standpoint, I think I've really been able to fill in those missing pieces. And that's my goal with that Q&A is just make sure that these burning questions get, get answered. All right, TNDM. This one's certainly improving. Um, longer term, 
and maybe it's a good problem to have. Longer term, it has a lot of issues. But deep, that's way back in 2016. Yeah, you'd be surprised how long people hold stocks, though. But I hear you. Uh, it's certainly an improving of the shorter term. My only concern is I, I wouldn't get – my methodology would not allow me to buy this stock unless it got past this prior peak in here. Notice how back here, thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback. This was really good back in here, especially since it was nice and persistent. But now it's kind of wide and loose. Even though it's improving, it would have to go to new highs for me to get excited about that. CVET. Excuse me. Well, uh, right now it looks like it's in trouble. And this is why I preach we don't take a trade in IPOs until they've traded for at least a week. Okay. So let's count this. One, two, three, four, five. So the first week it actually ended negative, even though it shot higher initially. So for me to get excited about this, I think what I would do is I would put a five period moving average into this chart and I would follow the, and I don't have a good name for it. I need to put my name on it, but whatever name I eventually come up with, the little IPO system where you need a close above, I'm sorry, you need a a low above the moving average, and you need to close at an all-time high, okay? So that would mean for this one, you would buy it if it was above 46. Now, just for S&Gs, and this is something else I picked up on that little retreat. If you ever have a chance to go to a trading retreat, boy, I'd highly recommend it. It's been fantastic. So let's put an alert on this at 46. And let's just let's just see what happens if it hits 46. Oh, symbol is a uh, C that. Does anybody know? Is it easier to put in alerts in a new TC? I'm going to have to switch over. I've been holding on to this one for 10 years, 20 years, <laughs> 30 years. All right, so now I have an alert on that. But yeah, there's nothing to do with that right now because it's going down. All right, next one's going to be Lulu. Lululemon. Well, that's a big cap stock. At least it is now. Um, it looks okay lately. It's been trending, but it is kind of all over the place longer term. My big problem with a big fat stock like this at high levels is it's probably priced for perfection. And I know as a trend follower, I shouldn't care. But... With a big cap stock, I tend to pick them apart a little bit more. And again, it's probably priced for perfection, meaning that since it is a big cap stock, it's well analyzed. I don't know how many analysts are following it now, but I think somebody a while back was pointing out that Apple had more analysts than they are stocks on the New York Stock Exchange or, or maybe all stock exchanges, major exchanges that is. And with these big cap stocks, if they begin to slip up a little bit, they can fall real hard. I actually have a strategy built on. Donald says, much easier in a new TC. Okay. All right. That's it, Donald. I'm going to have to I'm gonna have to at least, at least start using it a little bit. Is it browser-based or do you download something? I just don't want to do something browser-based. Okay. Um, this is one I've been watching. This is kind of a crazy one. So in a case like this, something that just takes off tremendously, I want to see the mother of all shakeouts here. This pullback is not deep enough, but this one has been making my momentum list as of late. And if it drops, let's say, to 16 or 17 or makes a nice TKO type of move, then I put it on my list. So keep this on your watch list. It's not set up at this particular point in time. Your choice of browser or desktop. Well, okay, I'm going to give it a shot. Thanks for thanks for your encouragement on that. VNTR, well, this one's shaping up kind of like a little uh, Phoenix type of stock. So I like this. It's not set up, but I like it. Okay. So notice we have a nice little bow tie sort of working here. Not exactly, but sort of. Uh, let's get back to just a clean chart. It's kind of made a bit of a cup and handle looking bottom. So if it could rally a little bit more and then pull back, 
yeah, so that's that's not bad. You could certainly do much worse. But it's not set up now, so so stay away. But hey, you, your picks are pretty good today, Donald. CRM. Well, this is another one of those cases where the stock just kind of barely got past its old high. It's a super thick stock, and it's also had a pretty good run in here as of late. And it's at high levels, so it's sort of like whatever one we were talking about a few minutes ago. It's kind of priced for perfection. So I would try to find stuff a little bit more smaller cap. Yeah, this one's been catching my eye. Now, if you look at the longer-term charts like Big Dave, that arrow points lower. And I can't argue with you on that. But shorter term, it is certainly shaped up in here. It's had a pretty nice run, followed by a pullback. Now, it is kind of thin considering it's only a buck twenty-five. So I'd say that looks pretty good. I think that's a – but it's going to be risky, okay? Use a very li liberal entry. And then maybe use what a dollar ninety five stop, <laughs> but yeah, that looks pretty good, Donald. And that is set up. Okay, AMD kind of all over the place. Um, you can see I drew in earlier. Just I'm not a big fan of buying stocks when they're trying to come back from high levels, but I guess it's not that high levels. Let's see. I just prefer stocks that are bottoming out longer term like we had back in 2015-16. So I think I'd pass on this one. It's just kind of all over the place. I hear you, though. It's tried to take off. But again, remember what I said earlier? Notice that this breakout's only two days, and then it's already given up quite a bit of that. So I think I'd pass on that one. It's And then if you look at the semis overall, and this is something I meant to show you earlier, but didn't get around to it. Notice that they still have quite a bit of overhead supply to get through. So that means that people might be looking to unload somewhere in this area. So I'd pass on that one. Weekly charts and 50 MA for SPX. It does not happen much, which is better daily or weekly signals. Well, your weekly signals are going to have a lot of lag, okay? And, of course, your daily signals might get you in too early. Um, I like daily signals... When you have a market like 2009 and the weeklies take a while to catch up. And by the way, bottoms tend to be, believe it or not, more spiky than tops, which is just the opposite of what I thought it would be. But, you know, case in point, just so happy to look at 2009. Look at the top in 2008. Took it forever to roll over, right? Well, everybody at Bradley thought the market crashed. No, it, it, it took forever to roll over. But then notice in 2009, big V bottom. So if you're coming off of 13-year lows or 15-year lows, whatever the case may be like that, and you have a V-shaped recovery, then I'm a little bit more excited about the daily. If you're at higher levels like we are now, then I'm more inclined to, to get more excited about something like the weekly chart. And that's why I came up with that little simple TFM system, just to, just to have a way – so I can tell the layman, look, let me just show you this little simple system, and maybe this will help you to make some longer-term decisions. Okay? So I don't think one is better than the other. I think you can look at both. I trade off the daily charts. You know, maybe in a future life I could trade off the weekly. I just don't know if I could do it or not. I'm just too – I'm too type A. I'm too active. Not that I'm pushing a button, get the, you know, trying to – push a button like the like the rat trying to get the cocaine on the screen. I, I forced myself not to do that. But at the other extreme, I just don't know if I could trade purely off of weeklies. And I've thought about it, too, because if you take a look at, like, weekly bow ties and all, we could and you could just pick a random uh, ETF if you want or indices, whatever you want to do. And as I often preach, just following those weekly bow ties, and I know you guys are sick of hearing this, but – would keep you short here, long here, short here, long here, and short once or twice somewhere in between. But for the most part, we'll keep you on the right side of the market. So longer term, I'm debating whether I should do something like that. PYX. That one keeps coming up a lot. Is that considered a weed stock?
I have a list of weed stocks. I got them off the internet. I just Googled pot stocks or something. And actually, uh, TC doesn't have them all because a lot of them are penny stocks and other things. And I'm not that I want to buy the penny stocks, but I'm long C-U-R-L-F, I think. And um, that one came up in the list. So it was kind of cool. And I just put those in into uh, Thinkorswim, which is a newer platform I've been using. By the way, if you... Um, if you do have Think or Swim, do me a big favor, and I'll give you a high five. I'll buy you a beer when I see you or a cup of coffee. Ask them to put my indicators into their platform, and uh, I, it'd be nice for me to use my own indicators. And I know I've bumped into a lot of people, like, they ask me, Dave, are your indicators in Think or Swim? I'm like, no. Would you ask them? And it's like, yeah, I'll ask them, and I don't think anybody's asked, so please ask them. Okay, so they said that they own real estate that's good for grow houses. All right. That's cool. I saw some some guy said uh, he was like anti weed stocks. I was like, okay, well, go have no fun somewhere else. I'm a trend follower. I don't care. All right. Um, it's kind of all over the place, but I hear you. And just for us, Jesus, take a look at weekly. Yeah, it's really all over the place weekly. But like I say with IPOs, sometimes an IPO come public and then go bottom out for months and months and months, and maybe even longer. And they reinvent themselves or with the Phoenix strategy, a company will reinvent themselves a little bit. So here we have a tobacco company that could easily use its real estate for grow houses. So it's reinventing itself. Maybe on a pullback. OK, let's just see what happens. HV is kind of crazy. I hear you, though. It made a nice run higher on a pullback. Maybe so. If this was a, a like an IPO, I think I'd be more all over it. But let's let's watch this one. Put it on your watch list. Do you follow the Fang stocks for market health? No, I don't, Tracy. Uh, you could. I mean, years ago, I forget it was the Four Horsemen. I say horse, and people laugh at me. My brother-in-law, especially horseman. How do you say it? Horseman? Four horse? Horseman? It was the Four Horsemen. I said it again. I forget what they were, but it was like uh, was it AMD? It was a list of these Intel. Intel, Apple, and a few others. And now it's the Fang stocks, uh, which are what? Facebook, Apple. Um, no, I don't watch those in general. I, I do a lot of empirical research. If you go through the market timing course, and then more specifically, if you go through the methodology in the members area, you'll, you'll get a feel for my market timing. And a lot of my market timing is letting the database tell me what to do. And I go through about 2,000 stocks every night and in doing that if i see a lot of buy signal setting up then i know that the market is healthy and i should be buying stocks um sometimes my own portfolio tells me a lot because momentum gets hit first so if i've got a bunch of momentum stocks in my portfolio which i usually do unless the market is rolled over and i'm mostly short and those stocks get hit what i'll do is uh oh, not what I'll do. That alerts me to the fact that the market could be turning. So I would encourage you to maybe keep momentum list if you're not in a bunch of momentum stocks. I used to keep what I call the Landry 100, and it was a lot of work, and I didn't really, I didn't really have a purpose to do it longer term. If you if you have the time, keep like a hundred stocks in your momentum list, and just put stocks in there that are making new highs when they begin to lose momentum, take them out. But if that list gets hit really hard, it's a really good indicator that the market's getting ready to get hit because that momentum gets hit first. So I don't watch these long-winded way of saying I don't really watch these FANG stocks that much. But there's nothing wrong with looking at them. All right. So PYX, we're going to call it a weed stock. That's cool. Any good IPH drink lately? Yeah. Um, Rhinestone. Oh, I like Rhinestone. Uh I was never, a, I never was really a hophead, and uh, now I'm becoming a little bit more of the hophead. I went to a, um, I guess you call it a beer tasting, and then after the thing was over, they can't legally they can't bring the beer home, and we were able to take home some of that rhinestone. It was pretty good. Um, Commotion, I think, was the latest one that I drank, and that's an APA, more of an APA from, uh, it might even be a wheat from Shreveport. Is pretty good. So if you get your hands on that, that rhinestone's a little hoppy, but I I I can drink it. Okay, you know, put a gun to my head, I can drink it. 
<laughs> I had a brewery in the garage and I sold it when uh, we started thinking about moving the house, moving the house, uh, getting a new house. But I'm getting ready to move not too far from a friend who has a brewery. So we'll just uh, I'll just brew at his house. Uh, this is way too thin. I don't know who asked about this. Howard. Yeah, it was Howard. Yeah, this is too thin. And, and with technical analysis, you have to have a representative sample. So you have to have enough people to where you can look at the chart and figure out what they've done or what they would like to do. A case like this, it's just way too thin. So I think it's a pig and a poke. What does that mean, a pig and a poke? I'm going to have to Google that. You're welcome, Tracy. Yeah, I like the New England style IPAs. Uh, Jucifer is pretty good. The uh, yeah, the the East Coast versus the West Coast. I like the East Coast ones better. Jucifer, which is a local brewery. Um, I haven't been active in the club lately. When I was active, I actually was. It's kind of cool because all you get to meet all these local brewers and all. And they they're just nice regular guys and fun to hang out with. But yeah, Jucifer is the uh, pretty good. I, I don't particularly go out and buy that but if it's on the shelf there's nothing else i'll certainly uh grab a six pack but yeah those hazy ips are good i just asked take a swim to add your indicators i'll let you know if they get back to me we might have to contact our congressman if we can't get tos to co co cooperate yeah thank you mike appreciate that i'll give you a high five when i see you bb for heinz uh let's see blackberry they're still in business Okay, let's see what we got here. Um, well, it has a lot of overhead supply, and I know if it made it all the way to 10, it would be a good problem to have, but I have a problem with that. I like getting into a stock that I think has unlimited potential and not have to be stopped at overhead supply when somebody might unload it. I hear you, though. It's had a nice thrust higher. It, it tends to be a bit of electric cardiogram longer term. It's certainly triggered shorter term. I guess if I had to pick one thing, it would be the overhead supply, and it's not just up here. It's also here, too. So I think you may be flying something a little bit cleaner. All right, anything else? We're right at the cusp of – oh, we're actually out of time. I like to keep the recordings within uh, an hour and a half. All right, going once, going twice. Well, as usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. Any unanswered questions, shoot me an email at daviddavidlander.com. And I'll either get around to them in the next week of charts, which we might not have one next week, by the way, because it's a shortened week. It's kind of hard to get a week of charts out of a shortened week. Or I'll cover it in a Q and A. If we don't talk to you now and then, everybody enjoy your long holiday weekend. Hopefully you guys are off on Monday. I know I am, but I won't be off. I'll be moving. <laughs> Uh, anyway, enjoy your weekend. I'll see you either next week or the week after. Thank you so much.